you all for coming. I want to welcome everyone to Sheridan Circle. Um, years from now, we're all going to be bragging about how we were here in Sheridan Circle in 2023. We'll be so proud of being present here today. We are gathered here because the dictatorship that seized power in Chile 50 years ago tried to put their bloody mark on this spot. But we have taken it back. Through our annual gatherings, we have turned the site of the assassination of Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Carpen Moffat into our place. Our place for remembering our fallen heroes, a place for renewing our commitment to justice and democracy, and a place of hope. I'm Sarah Anderson. I work at the Institute for Policy Studies where Orlando and Ronnie were working at the time of their death at the hands of agents of the Chilean dictatorship in 1976. I want to thank everyone in this audience who, like my IPS colleagues, have demonstrated the power of persistence. This past half century of history has been painful, but through solidarity, we have achieved many measures of justice and the struggle continues. Two years ago, a very persistent person, the writer Ariel Dorfman, was here in Sheridan Circle. And he talked about how excited he was by the young people in Chile who had taken to the streets and were fighting inequality and demanding transformative change. And he told us that there, one of these young Chilean leaders was actually a serious contender for the presidency. I think we know how that turned out. honored to have you here with us today on this hallowed ground. Our first speaker is someone with a very personal connection to this history as the son of Marcus Raskin, the Institute for Policy Studies co-founder whose colleagues were killed here at Sheridan Circle. And he connects to this history through his life's work as a champion of democracy at home and abroad. Please welcome our hero, Congressman John Jamie Raskin. against the dire threat of authoritarianism, whereas Chile is a strategic 
partner of the United States in the bilateral relationship, which includes cooperation on economic, environmental, defense, and human rights issues, is predicated on a shared commitment to democratic values, including absolute respect for the right to vote in free and fair elections, and whereas, and then it gets into some of the dirty parts about Henry Kissinger um, and the promotion of the coup, um, and um, yes, more Henry Kissinger and uh, <laughs> the rampant human rights violation, violations that the CIA was complicit in, and whereas the U.S. Congress played a critical role in bringing to light the atrocities committed by the Pinochet regime against the Chilean people, a growing congressional awareness of the role of the United States in the 1973 coup and ongoing U.S. support for the Pinochet regime led to the creation in 1977 of what's now the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the Department of State, charged with the mission of maintaining the centrality of human rights in U.S. foreign policy. Okay, and here's the big resolved clause. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives, by the Senate of the United States, that Congress recognizes the decades-long effort of the pro-democracy forces of Chile that with support from human rights movements in the United States and all over the world, ended the dictatorship and restored civilian government to Chile. And it applauds the Chilean people. It expresses profound regret for the U.S. contribution to destabilizing democratic institutions in Chile um, and expresses regret for U.S. assistance to the Pinochet coup. And it states that we emphasize that support for human rights is and will always remain a key pillar of United States foreign policy and the relationship between the United States and Chile and everywhere else in the world. So anyway, we're fighting to pass this next week. And I uh, give you a copy of that. Uh, and then, uh, and then this is one uh, that I've already gotten through, and I wrote it myself, so it's a little bit more succinct than that they wrote over the Senate side. Uh, but, um, and it's, uh, you know, I don't get everything through in the, the Kevin McCarthy Congress, but um, we got this one through. Um, they, they, weren't, they weren't watching that carefully. But it's a, it's a certificate of special congressional recognition presented in the Institute for Policy Studies in recognition of decades of remarkable institutional perseverance, passionate devotion to restoring democracy and freedom to the people of Chile, and your unswerving determination to honor Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Carpen Moffitt's heroic pursuit of global social justice presented September 23, 2023 by Jamie Raskin on behalf of the U.S. House of Representatives. So, moments in the air, okay? So it's been 47 years, as I counted, someone correct me, but I think 47 years since fascist agents of Augusto Pinochet and Dina assassinated IPS fellow and former Chilean ambassador to the United States, Orlando Letelier, detonating a bomb um, just a few yards away from here in Orlando's car, which killed him and Ronnie Carpen Moffat and uh, wounded Michael Moffat who was in the back seat of the car at the time. It's been 50 years since Pinochet um, and an authoritarian right-wing military faction and right-wing forces in Chile, backed by the CIA, organized a military coup against Chilean democracy and the legitimate government of Salvador Allende in Chile. It's been 33 years since the fall of Pinochet and the return to constitutional democracy in Chile. It has been two years since Donald Trump and right-wing forces in America attempted a political coup to overthrow the American presidential election, which Joe Biden won by more than 7 million votes, 306 to 232 in the Electoral College, and unleashed a violent insurrection against the Congress, the Vice President, and the American constitutional order. There have been hundreds of arrests, trials, and convictions of participants and charges ranging from assaulting a federal officer to destroying federal property to seditious conspiracy 
which means conspiracy to overthrow or put down the government of the United States. The former president is now facing four criminal indictments with 91 specific criminal charges all over the United States of America. It has been 60 years since IBS was created, and I know because I'm the exact same age as IBS, uh, it has been 60 years since IBS was created as the first think tank of American progressive liberalism and really the first public policy think tank in America to defend human rights and peace, social justice, and strong democracy. Now, on this, on this somber anniversary, everyone in the Americas and everyone all over the world should teach their children and their grandchildren what a coup is, a violent and unlawful seizure of state power in violation of the constitutional order. Facing violent insurrection in 1861, President Lincoln defined the situation very well. Insurrection, Lincoln said, is largely a war upon the very first principle of popular government, the rights of the people, specifically the right of the people, to choose their own leaders in a democratic constitutional process. This was the right that was wrenched away from the Chilean people by fascists backed by the CIA on September 11, 1973. This was the same right that came under vicious assault in America by fascists and plutocrats and kleptocrats on January 6, 2021. I was only 10 years old when democracy was dismembered in Chile, but I remember well the grainy photos of Augusto Pinochet in the newspaper, his unsmiling face, the, stealing, the steely, idiotic, fascist gaze and determination to use violent force and military power to extinguish democratic life and to take power for himself and his friends. He would oversee the torture and the murder of tens of thousands of civilians in Chile. I was 13 years old when Orlando and Ronnie were killed right here. And I had a message that came to school saying that I should come right home after school. And I was on the bus coming just, well, uh, around here in circle. Um, and we were stuck for several hours in traffic because it was still a crime scene um, at that point. And none of us knew what had happened and what was going on. It was before cell phones took place. But I remember, I remember going to see Michael Moffat that night um, with my parents and um, with the Barnetts. And, uh, and I remember Michael uh, reconstructing the details of what had taken place um, and describing the horror of the explosion in the car. Um, and um, uh, I remember everybody just weeping and not sleeping for days uh, at the loss of uh, of Orlando, who everybody loved, and Ronnie, who everybody loved, who often babysat for me and for uh, my siblings. And I remember my dad, and I remember Dick Barnett, and Saul Landau, and the other fellows holding a press conference and declaring that whatever else would happen, IPS would find the killers of their colleagues and see that justice was done. And, watching my dad and hearing him say that long after Pinochet is gone and long after the dictatorship has fallen and long after the murderers have been found and arrested, long after the complicity of the CIA in dismantling democracy in Chile was exposed, IPS and the forces of freedom and democracy would still be here fighting for the future of humanity. And he called on everybody to act with courage. When everything looks hopeless, my dad said, then you are the hope. You are the hope. It is, it is a mistake to think of fascism as having a fixed ideological content. As Madeleine Albright said in her book, Fascism a Warning, the ideological content of fascism is mutating. It is constantly changing. What is central 
is the desire for power, the determination to seize and hold power at all costs for a minority group in society against and over the will and the welfare and the interests and the values of the vast majority of people. The dynamic ideological ingredients of fascism appear and, re and reappear in different forms, in different places, at different times in history. Racism and authoritarianism, anti-Semitism, militarism, misogyny, corporate control, propaganda, disinformation, conspiracy theory, immigrant bashing, cultish mind control, theocracy, destruction of the language, assault on thinking in universities, and always repression and violence. But I want to leave you with the thought and the feeling that I got from my dad and from all of his colleagues at IPS and from around the world, which is that the spirit of freedom and democracy is always changing and moving and growing too. It's like a chain letter that's sent down from one generation to the next generation. In America, from the revolutionaries to the abolitionists and the reconstruction fighters to the feminists and the suffragettes and the populists and the progressives and the new dealers to the civil rights movement and the LGBTQ movement and the women's movement and the anti-war movement, the peace movement, the labor movement, um, all of them have carried the spirit of democracy and freedom in our country. And the spirit of freedom is expressed too in our literature, in our poetry, our music, our theater, our culture, and our lives. It was expressed in my dad's music, in his piano. It was expressed in Ronnie's project setting up the music carry out in Adams Morgan bringing her beloved music to new generations of kids. It was expressed in Orlando's music, in the poetry of his extraordinary language, and in all of the love of family and friends and community that they lived with every day, a love that they expressed both in their political engagement and also in their creative expression. I've got a poster on the wall of my office in the Rayburn House office building that Aviva Kepner gave me. I don't know if Aviva's here today. Uh, there's Aviva. And uh, it's got Orlando's beautiful image on it. And it's got this statement that he made on the day that Pinochet and his fascist government took power and purported to strip Orlando Letelier of his citizenship. And the quote says this, I was, I was born a Chilean. I'm a Chilean and I will die a Chilean. They were born traitors. They live as traitors, and they will be known forever as fascist traitors. And our, our historical memory and our precision about these events, our commitment to accountability and justice, this is the beginning of the struggle in our times to defend and expand democratic freedom against its fascist enemies all over the world. I leave you with the words of two great freedom fighters, one from Maryland, born just about 45 minutes away from here, the great Frederick Douglass, who said, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. And the struggle may be moral, it may be physical, it may be moral and physical, but there must be struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. There's a message to you from the people of Maryland today. And I, I leave you uh, finally, Mr. President, with the words of the great Tom Paine who came over to uh, our country in 1774, two years before the American Revolution. And he fell in love with the promise of America. He said if America lived up to its ideals, it would become an asylum to humanity. Not an insane asylum, mind you, but a place of refuge for people seeking freedom from political and religious and economic oppression all over the world. In 1776, it was a tough time because don't forget, for the vast majority of human history, for all of human history living up to then, most people lived under the bullies and the dictators, the autocrats and the kleptocrats and 
the theocrats, people like Donald Trump and Augusto Pinochet and Vladimir Putin. That was the fate of humanity. And America was trying to discover another possible path for our species. But a lot of people were walking around saying, I don't know if we can really do it. We don't know if democracy and freedom and constitutionalism could actually work on Earth. Can you beat the kings and the queens and the lords? And so Tom Bain wanted to write a pamphlet to give people hope, to give people a sense that we could make history move in this direction. And he wrote a pamphlet called The Crisis. And I'm going to just quote a little passage for you. And I'm going to update the language a little bit so as not to offend uh, modern sensibilities, and this isn't the instruction of Nancy Pelosi, uh, <laughs> who said that, you know, Maine was a feminist, and that he was. He was an early suffragist, and he wouldn't mind. But anyway, Maine said, these are the times that try men and women's souls. <laughs> these are the times that try men and women's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink at this moment from the service of their cause and their country. But everyone that stands with us now will win the love and the favor and the affection of every man and every woman for all time. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. But we have this saving consolation. The more difficult the struggle, the more glorious in the end will be our victory. Let's let that victory be ours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to recognize another one in the crowd, former Senator Tom Harkin is here. Shaking arrest of Pinochet in 1998, I remember Mark Raskin called up Ronnie's father and asked if he would help push for prosecution. And Murray Carpin, like thousands of others, was committed to turning his family's tragedy into a force for justice. And so he stepped up, he spoke out in the media, he spoke on Capitol Hill, he spoke at the British Embassy, he spoke here in Sheridan Circle. And we're so honored to have with us here today Ronnie's brother Michael and niece uh, Rebecca Carpin and several other Carpin family members. I'd like to thank you for coming here today. Thank you. I'd like to tell your family has brought a wealth of talents to the pursuit of justice. Orlando's widow Isabel worked at IPS uh, with a Third World Women's Project for many years. Um, two of her sons who are here today have worked in exile to use their artistic talents to uh, keep the memory alive and connect the Chilean struggle to other movements. Uh, and uh, other sons back in Chile have uh, represented um, th this fight as well. And so I want to invite uh, former Chilean senator and Orlando's son Juan Pablo Letelier to the stage uh, with his other brothers. Presidente Gabriel Boric, señor ministro, congressman, Jamie, Senator Ricardo Lagos, dear Ambassador Juan Gabriel Valdez, he's more than an ambassador to us, he's our friend, he's part of our family. Today, Ambassador to the UN, who's here. Dear friends and family from the IPS, and from this wonderful community here in D.C., Wool, and so many others who are with us. Dear friends, 
This is a site of cultural memory. This is a memory site that has been built during the last 47 years, led by the IPS. This has been a, a place where the Let Their Movement Fund, where fabulous voices have built a memory site. Hands, struggles, we have built what is here today. We as a family are, are full of gratitude, extreme gratitude. Marcus Raskin, Dick Barnett, Saul Landau are something extremely close to us. But there was a dozens of uh, congressmen and congresswomen who opened their doors, who picked up the phone. One of them went to knock on a detention center in Chile. Senator Harkin, thank you for your bravery. <laughs> so many of the Latvier Moffitt awardees strugglers from the U.S., strugglers from different quarters of Latin America, have made this memory site. Brave and incredible people who once and again put their lives on the line, who had their convictions, but above all, their love, and tried to do the right thing. The cultural memory site is an act of solidarity, this is a universal response to injustice, to abuse, to inequality. Sheridan Circle. General Philip Sheridan is here in the circle. There's a circle, the main circle in Santiago. There was a military, Manuel Baquedano. They have in common something. They have in common the way they understood how conflict resolution should occur. They believed and they acted in consequence using violence to resolve conflicts, to impose their ideas in wars and against Native Americans to take their lands or in Chile to take their land. In the past and in the present, there are those who think that conflict resolution can be done with violence. In Chile today, there are still some people who believe that the coup was correct. Trying to avoid understanding that with the coup came human rights violations, terrorist acts in Chile and abroad. You can't disassociate them. They go hand in hand. And it's the same type of people like those who stormed Capitol Hill. They think that they can impose their ideas and resolve their conflicts with violence. We're different. We are part of a cultural memory site who has been built with conviction, with love, but above all, with principles of justice, peace, and dignity. We cherish, we remember Orlando and Ronnie. We remember also Ruji. We remember also other American citizens like Charles Foreman. Rodrigo Rojas. We remember him today. So many who are part of this history. When we finish this activity, we're going to cross the road and we're going to put a flower, lay a flower down. We as a family are extremely grateful. We have a place 
where we can lay a flower down. But for us, there are too many people who still can't do that. Not only in Chile, in Argentina, in Africa, here in the U.S. And that's why I want to thank President Gabriel Boric so profoundly with his initiative to assume that the Chilean state will have the commitment to seek closure for all the relatives and families of the detained disappeared. It's an act of humanity. anybody, but he's been on one line, human rights have to prevail with our principles of justice, peace, and dignity, which is what Orlando believed in and what Ronnie struggled for. Thank you very much. different places. My brother and I have been in Chile and the United States back and forth. As we go through life, we acquire places of belonging, places that become home or home away from home. Sometimes they correspond to geographical locations, but often our places of belonging are based only on relationships of the mind and heart. Here at this circle, I've been part of a family for 47 years. Like Jamie, our formation is part of this place. And it's a family that continues to grow. And this place, this ground we stand on, transcends location, nation, and time itself. We gain something whenever we gather here. I know that my father, Orlando, and Ronnie would urge us to continue forward, would tell us that the only meaning we can give to the lives who have come before us is in how we respond to their absence. Today is a day of satisfaction, but it's also a resolve and of strength. I'm here with my son, Matias. My brothers, Cristian and Juan Pablo, are here with other beloved family. My brother, Jose, sends his warmest Yorana and Rabanui. My mother, Isabel, will want me to tell her everything about what has happened here today. Ambassador Gabriel Valdez, he shares our history and again makes a place for all Chileans in this ground of memory. We resonate now. Thanks for talking about Thomas Paine. We ring through the Americas to Punta Arenas and beyond. Many of us have kept this place of memory and we await those who arrive. They've been on their way for a long time through difficult struggles. We wait for them knowing that they are part of the memories we keep President Gabriel Boric has a place here ever since the student movement was awarded the Letelier Moffitt Awards. <laughs> we welcome him home to this authentic nation that is also Chile, that crosses borders, that resonates with those who came before us. We are honored. A bedrock floor below our feet and other crystalline rocks underlie the bedrock of the District of Columbia. 
and we can stamp the ground underneath our feet and know that we are bedrock. When we are far away, when we are uncertain, we can return to this place, this moment of us together. Like many of you, I have felt grief here, but I've also found joy. I've been inspired and found on this ground a way forward. Today we make our actions count. We want to be on the right side of history. We want to head in the right direction. We welcome other members of this extended family of these global movements for justice through the Letelier Moffitt Awards. We're stronger to have all of you with us, all of them with us. I'm sorry. We're so intertwined. Our memories, our lives, and our struggles. We've been here and we continue to be essential to these movements. We're part of the bedrock. We're part of this ground. We accumulate rings of knowledge like hardwood, like ancient growth, like alerces. Let's celebrate the lives of the many who move ahead of us and who now, like Orlando, like Ronnie, like Salvador Allende, and those who are absent, urge us, urge us to respond and to continue. Let's continue to lay foundations. Let's feel the earth under our feet. Let's be bedrock for the future. Thank you. of inviting representatives of the Chilean government here to Sheridan Circle, no matter who's in power. And as our longtime ally, uh, Mark Schneider, has pointed out, the fact that they always show up is a sign of the strength of Chile's democracy. This year, we're particularly thrilled to welcome to Sheridan Circle a leader who embraces a bold vision and an understanding from his own personal experience of the need for people power to achieve that vision. Please welcome to Sheridan Circle, President Gabriel. energy here, the Washington crying, but all of us here gathered happy and celebrating life, not death. That's an inequivocal way to say that we won, that Orlando's and Ronnie's ideals won, and we are very proud of us, of that. And my generation, I was born 10 years after Orlando was killed. My generation is deeply moved and deeply grateful of the thought they gave, of the life they, they gave to us. So I have, of course, prepared a speech. Um, it's kind of difficult to talk after what we've heard here, but I'm going to deliver it in, in Spanish because I know there are people in Chile that didn't know Orlando, didn't know Ma Ronnie Muffet, that are also listening or maybe will listen this in the future. And I want them also 
from here, from Washington, to understand what this means. So, for all of you, and I understand most of you speak Spanish, comes the following words. Compatriotas, amigos, queridos, que hoy nos acompañan, agradezco profundamente las inspiradoras palabras de quienes han tomado el micrófono antes que yo y lo digo sinceramente no por protocolo porque escucharlo a ustedes enseña y no es de estas actividades en que uno espera que terminen los discursos para ver cuándo termina el acto pese a que está lloviendo, pese a que nos moquemos, pese a que está frío sino que realmente emociona y nos vamos con un pedacito de vida que no teníamos antes Quiero también rendir un homenaje sentido a todos quienes hacen posible esta ceremonia año a año. Qué importante lo que dices de que desde 1990 todos los años se reúnen. No sé si serán todos los años la misma gente, seguramente habrán años que hay más, hay menos, pero todos los años desafían la muerte con este acto. Y especialmente al Institute for Policy Studies, IPS, que no solo acogió a nuestros compatriotas en los momentos más difíciles, en la noche más larga de nuestra patria, sino que ha contribuido a mantener viva su memoria y su lucha a través de los años. Ayer Orlando, Orlando, perdón, Juan Pablo, me recordaba que el 2012, Noam Peterman con Camila Vallejo, en ese entonces presidente de las federaciones, estudiant de federaciones estudiantiles en Chile recibieron acá el premio Orlando Letelier y Ronnie Maffin. Camila, ustedes saben, hoy es la vocera de nuestro gobierno. Noam es un intelectual orgánico, público, que sigue defendiendo, sigue defendiendo los mismos valores. Y yo, habiendo sido dirigente estudiantil, valoro mucho esa persistencia de la fundación del IPS por mantener viva esa llama por la que Orlando y Ronnie dieron su vida. Hace pocos días atrás, hace pocos días atrás conmemoramos los 50 años del golpe de Estado del 11 de septiembre de 1973, que como bien dice Juan Pablo, es indivisible ese momento es indivisible de las violaciones a los derechos humanos que acaecieron desde el mismo día en que quebraron la democracia. Pese a que hay quienes insisten en que el golpe era inevitable, desde aquí y desde todas partes del mundo les decimos que la democracia siempre tiene caminos, que los golpes de Estado nunca son inevitables y que siempre... Siempre habrá un espacio para el diálogo, para la conversación, para el respeto entre quienes piensan distinto. Que le gane a la violencia, al uso de la fuerza y a la imposición por las armas de las ideas propias. En esta conmemoración, en uno de los patios de la moneda, el querido grupo Iyapu cantó en homenaje a las víctimas de las violaciones a los derechos humanos. Aunque los pasos toquen mil años este sitio, no borrarán la sangre de los que aquí cayeron. Seguramente algunos reconocen esta frase, son versos de Pablo Neruda, que a continuación rezan, y no se extinguirá jamás la hora en que caísteis, aunque miles de voces crucen este silencio. Esas palabras resuenan con fuerza el día de hoy en que conmemoramos la partida de Ronnie Maffet y de Orlando Leterier y también los 50 años de la muerte en extrañísimas circunstancias del mismo bate Pablo Neruda. Que hay un fallo pendiente de la Corte Suprema que debiera estar además por evacuarse durante las próximas semanas o meses para poder establecer la verdad judicial respecto a qué fue lo que le pasó y por qué fue silenciado. No se extingue ni se extinguirá jamás la hora en que cayeron aquí en Sheridan Circle, Orlando Letelier del Solar y Ronnie Carpenter Muffet, 
alcanzado por el puño de la dina. Y cuando decimos el puño de la dina, ellos se solazaban de aquello. Eso es lo brutal de estas violaciones a los derechos humanos. Primero se solazaron de ellas. El símbolo de la dina era un puño de fierro. Ese era su símbolo oficial. Se solazaron, después lo negaron. Bien lo puede decir Tom Harkin, who was knocking doors in Chile, to know what was really happening. And he discovered Villa Grimaldi, a place where a lot of people were tortured, and a lot of people were disappeared. That was the last place where they were seen. Se solazaron de las violaciones a los derechos humanos. Después trataron de ocultarlas. Después las negaron y después se desentendieron. Y hasta el día de hoy hay muchos que siguen en la impunidad y cuando hay quienes osan pedir a las víctimas que acá hay en su duelo que den vuelta a la página, yo me atrevo humildemente a decirles habiendo conversado con muchísimas de las víctimas, que esa reconciliación solo es posible con verdad y con justicia, no con olvido. Y con el compromiso profundo y la convicción caliente de que estos hechos no se pueden volver a repetir. Y que sabemos la democracia está amenazada en diferentes formas. Quizás hoy día estas formas son distintas a las de hace 50 años, pero nuestro compromiso con ella y con el respeto irrestricto a los derechos humanos debe ser total sin importar las circunstancias, porque no hay inevitables en la historia. Hemos sabido, gracias a archivos desclasificados mucho tiempo después del crimen, que ese puño de la dina que alcanzó en este Sheridan Circle a Orlando y Bonnie fue ordenado directamente por el dictador. Muchas gracias, Peter Cornwood, que está por acá, por la World Big Gun. Por la World Big Gun. Because you find this archive. Y le agradezco profundamente a Jamie Raskin, uh, AOC, and all the other congressmen and women, Bernie Sanders, of course, who, who entered this, this project of resolution. And it's really significant to us. It's really, really, it really means more than something. It has been commented on Chile. We are looking forward to its voting. And We really expect that the U.S. has a reflection, a more deep reflection, and I know that you are doing that, but just a more deeper reflection on, on what they push in Chile. And not only in Chile, in other places in Latin America. El año en que el Estado de Chile utilizó todos los medios a su alcance y emprendió, emprendió una política de exterminio cuyas huellas imborrables seguimos arrastrando hasta hoy, Orlando Letelier tuvo la valentía de denunciar, habiendo estado preso en el confín del mundo, en Magallanes, en la isla Dawson, que la represión política, y esto es muy importante porque de esto no se habla tanto, que la represión política era indisociable de la revolución económica desde arriba que estaba impulsando la dictadura, que nos iba a alegar dolor y miseria. Porque hay quienes tratan de separarlo también todavía, y quienes nos dicen, claro, condenamos las violaciones a los derechos humanos, pero hay que reconocer, dicen aquellos, que el éxito económico de la dictadura son indisociables. Son indisociables. Y Orlando Letelier lo entendió desde un principio y por eso Orlando Letelier, por esa voz fuerte, lúcida, fue identificado como una amenaza. 
a propósito de los 50 años, nuestra ministra del Interior, Carolina Toá, cuyo padre también fue brutalmente asesinado por la dictadura, habiendo estado preso junto con Orlando Nicadauso. Nos recordaba Carolina que el único proyecto refundacional que se llevó a cabo en la historia reciente chilena fue el que impulsó el neoliberalismo a ultranza apoyándose en las armas, el terror y el silenciamiento de las disidencias y la clausura de las instituciones democráticas. Yo concuerdo con Carolina Toá. Orlando Letelier y Rolly Moffitt fueron asesinados aquí porque su trabajo de solidaridad y de denuncia representaba una amenaza para ese proyecto refundacional. Y es que desde que fue expulsado de Chile, tras pasar casi un año preso en Isla Dawson, Orlando desplegó su reconocida energía y capacidad para acercar posiciones, para tejer alianzas, para persuadir a altos personeros de gobierno foráneo de que los crímenes cometidos contra el pueblo de Chile merecían una sanción y que lo que se estaba haciendo era inaceptable. Y para eso contó con la ayuda invaluable y qué emocionante saber que esa, esa huella sigue hasta hoy, marcando camino, abriendo sendas de instituciones como la IPS. Durante 1974 y 1975, la dictadura civil-militar chilena, que también había civiles, asesinó en Buenos Aires al comandante, al ex comandante en jefe del ejército, general Carlos Prats y su esposa, Sofía Kutberg, y atentó en Roma contra el ex vicepresidente de Chile durante el gobierno de Eduardo Frei Montalva, don Bernardo Leighton y su esposa, Anita Fresno. El atentado contra Orlando Letelier y Ronnie Maffitt, un año después, no fue casualidad, no fue un exceso fue parte de una política sistemática de silenciamiento a quienes desde el extranjero, porque se les había negado su propia patria, estaban denunciando lo que ocurría en Chile. Entonces no nos pueden decir, y es importante que lo sepamos, que hay excesos que son condenables, pero si hay excesos significa que hay una esencia que no lo sería. Nosotros no condenamos solamente los excesos, estamos en contra y nos rebelamos contra la esencia de la dictadura. Porque mientras en nuestro país la policía secreta detenía, secuestraba, interrogaba, torturaba, exiliaba, exoneraba a miles de chilenos y chilenas inocentes. Y es que cuando se echa a andar la máquina del terror, cuesta mucho y es muy difícil detenerla. Y la banalidad del mal también se hace presente. Prats, Leighton, Letelier, Rodrigo Rojas, Teregui, así como tantas otras miles de víctimas a veces anónimas o cuyos nombres... Nos recuerdan esas caras en blanco y negro, esas fotos en blanco y negro que portan todavía familiares vivos. Encarnaban todo aquello que la dictadura quería borrar de la faz de la tierra y de la memoria de nuestra patria chile. Como escribió Saúl Landau, de cuyo fallecimiento se cumplieron 10 años, hace solo un par de días, Orlando representaba todas las cualidades que debía tener un gobierno. Era un abogado que creía en las normas y en la Constitución. Su ética era en la igualdad y la justicia. Y la razón era su instrumento de persuasión y autoridad. Hoy, a 50 años del quiebre de la democracia en Chile, rendimos homenaje a quienes dieron su vida en nuestra patria y fuera de ella por restaurar la República, reconstruir nuestra convivencia, y reconstruir la democracia a partir del respeto irrestricto a los derechos humanos. A ellos les debemos en parte ser hoy una democracia pujante que busca nuevos caminos de equidad y en donde, pese a que tenemos profundas diferencias, nos respetamos con quienes son nuestros adversarios 
y podemos conversar y poner a Chile delante de nuestras divisiones. En donde la libertad y el pluralismo están garantizados para todos y todas. Y en donde también el Estado se hace cargo de modo permanente de la búsqueda de la verdad, la justicia y la garantía de no repetición. Solo así podremos, las generaciones que vienen, las que tomamos ese legado, las que tomamos esa aposta, reclamar la herencia de una generación de chilenas y chilenos que nos marcaron a fuego con su ejemplo de dignidad, de decencia, también de alegría. Porque esto no solamente es un duelo, lo es por cierto, hay dolor, hay tweet, pero también hay alegría en su memoria. Y que dieron sus vidas y su testimonio de vocación de servicio público en defensa de los postergados, de la promoción del diálogo y de la democracia. Desde Chile y en representación del gobierno de Chile, honramos su memoria trabajando día a día por fortalecer y cuidar esa democracia alzando la voz ante las violaciones a los derechos humanos sin importar el color político de quienes las vulneren y luchando por un mundo más humano, más libre, más justo, más equitativo y más feliz. Un mundo como el que soñaron Salvador Allende, a quien ayer homenajeaba, no yo, no un presidente de izquierda, no el embajador del gobierno en Chile, sino los 32 países de la Organización de Estados Americanos, poniéndole su nombre, con un cuadro además, a la puerta central del de edificio de la Organización de Estados Americanos. Un mundo como el que soñaron Allende, Orlando Letelier y Ronnie Moffitt, sigue siendo posible. Democracia siempre. Muchísimas gracias.